Sergeant Sergeant Kip here with Company D, Sick United States Sharpshooters. And thanks for joining us on another episode of Reenacting 101. Today, this is going to be an introductory lesson for all of you new to the hobby and new to camp craft about edged tools. Now, there's going to be so much difference between um, all of you out there. I wanted to present a few topics. So if you're new to the idea of what to carry for an an edge tool at an event, you can start a conversation within your company, within your unit, um, see how it connects to your research and your unit's impression and history and um, its region to make sure that those edge tools uh, reflect your personal needs in the hobby and your unit's um, unique history and reports. So, we did a couple of sample things that you could likely do around camp with various edged tools. Now, you don't have to be an advanced bushcrafter and you don't have to collect every type of edge tool and have it with you at every event. That's impractical and soldiers typically didn't carry all of these. Uh, for those of you uh, hardcores out there, you might be saying, well, none of these were actually issued to the troops. It's like, well, that's true, unless you were in you know, one of the pioneer units um, but keep in mind, soldiers had easy access to tools whenever they needed them. They um, were also followed by miles of wagon train. So these soldiers didn't manage to um, build bridges, make camps, uh, make fires, and all the other sort of tool required tasks with just their bare hands. They didn't karate chop firewood. So they had ready access to edged tools. Now, I think every reenactor should have a personal knife. It's incredibly practical. And to keep it super simple, you have two choices. You have a fixed blade, like this one you can pick up uh, affordably from Townsend's. You can buy a uh, sheath from Townsend's for his knives, or you could do what I did and just make one up really quick out of some scrap leather. Um, these are really nice. Uh, you can see that you know you can baton uh, larger pieces of wood uh, with a fixed knife. Uh, it's, it can be safer because you don't have to worry about the, the blade folding on you. You can do uh, fine tasks with a, a good uh, mid-sized fixed blade knife like this. It's um, you know hand forged, uh, nice uh, wooden scales. These are these are really nice to have. You can also you know cook with, use it to cook and cut your meat and process your food, um, as well as finer tasks that you might need. The downside is carrying it. Um, this one doesn't have a belt loop, but you would need to have a, a belt loop of some sort in order to carry this securely. You would also need some form of um, civilian belt uh, to have it with you readily, because uh, you're not going to have your um, cartridge belt on all the time, especially for like fatigue duties or your hanging around camp. So you're going to have to factor in how you would carry this. Um, the other thing is you would possibly keep it in your knapsack or your haversack and keep it secured um, in, in a sheath that it can't come out of. Some of your unit's regulations, uh, your reenacting groups, organizations may require these to be tied in or additionally secured, especially if you're uh, wearing this during a battle event. So factor all of that in as far as the convenience of this. Um, if you don't need a knife on you personally all the time and you could keep this in your, uh, in your tent or in your knapsack, this could be a really wonderful tool for you to have. Now, what I started carrying this last year is a Marlin Spike knife. Uh, Company D, you know, is from the state of Maine and we would have been more experienced with the maritime culture. So I got a Marlin spike knife. This is a, a Marlin spike. Use it in rope work. It's incredibly handy. Um, you don't really realize how handy it is until you actually have one. And so the Marlin spike uh, will, will lock into place, but the blade itself does not. So it's a non-locking non blade. They, you can pick up originals of these. These, these handles would have originally been um, probably some sort of horn or, or bone. Uh, I saw an original from the 1830s, looked exactly like this, but made with period materials for, I don't know, 300 some dollars. So if you wanted to get originals, they're out there because they were common in 
the, you know, in the maritime industry. Um, this one is a modern German Navy one. You can get off of eBay. I think I paid oh, $25 for it. Um, it has like Delrin scales or some sort of plastic, um, nice thick brass and stainless steel. So the stainless, of course, is not period correct, but it's going to take uh, a lot of beating. And, you know, from several feet away, it looks the part. Um, the whole style and everything fits and it works for me and it's incredibly handy. The pocket knife is great because you don't need a sheath. You don't have to have a belt to wear it. You can keep it in your trousers or wherever you need it. Uh, so you can get to it quickly uh, and you can do many of the same things um, these uh, sailing knives have a really thick spine on the blade um, I, I mostly use this for you know cu cutting my meat and my food uh, cutting strings when I'm sewing and a lot of rope work that I do around the camp so this has a lot of utility and it can get you out of a lot of troubles because you can always have it with you um, the other thing you can do is, uh, if you're just starting the hobby, have a low budget. Uh, sutlers do sell various pocket knives. They, the import ones are super cheap and poorly made. But if you just need a beater knife, you know, for like five or ten bucks, that might get you by. But there are a lot of historical alternatives that would really work well for you. Uh, so do some research into. Uh, what sort of knives are available? Uh, maybe your unit in particular was used to knife, had like a certain type of knife. Uh, it may reflect the type of trade that your unit um, had a lot of. Uh, so figure that out and then be honest with yourself. I mean, what sort of blade are you likely to get the most use out, out of and serve the most of your needs? Uh, is it going to be a fixed blade or is it going to be a pocket knife? Now, you're probably asking because you saw it earlier in the video. What about the Arkansas toothpick? Well, um, there, are, there were plenty of these in the Civil War. This was a, a gift from a wonderful fellow reenactor. I don't really hardly ever use it. Um, it's pretty impractical, I think, in many cases. Uh, but if your unit, you're the person you're portraying, did carry one, I'm sure you can find all sorts of safe and beneficial uses for it. It's going to be kind of impractical, and you're going to look ridiculous cutting up your potatoes. For supper with this thing um, but for larger bushcraft tasks like this can get you a long ways um, but as far as like um, you know fine work it's kind of impractical um, and you're you know it, it's kind of up to you whether or not you carry these these are really heavy so factor that in it's it looks cool but i really kind of think i feel like that's where um I think that's where it kind of ends right there as far as its usefulness in the hobby. These these were used in combat and you par probably wouldn't get a whole lot of personal camp use out of it. But these are out there and there are people who do like really big knives uh, for bushcraft work. So this could be a personal preference. You could learn to, you know, cut strings and cut ropes and eat your food with it and do uh, camp craft with it easily and comfortably. Uh, it just might take uh, a little more practice to, to be safe around such a large, um, sharp instrument such as uh, a Bowie knife. Then uh, you have to start figuring out how prepared is your overall unit with tools and what are your personal needs for tools. Because the next step of the intro to edge tools is going to be firewood processing. Now, I highly recommend that every reenactor, even if you don't take it to every event, have a hatchet. These are incredibly handy. I, this one will always be in my knapsack from now on. I made a cover for it. And uh, this is in the period style common during the Civil War. Uh, the Liberty Rifles did a good article on um, axes on their website. And you can also find this exact same style head in this magazine right here from a personal collection. And so, yeah, I mean, you can see that's, that's pretty much bang on. Now, I don't know exactly when this head was made. It did, doesn't have any maker's marks or anything like that, but it, it, it's in the same style. So I have a nice documented uh, hatchet head 
which is incredibly handy. Um, the head itself only cost me like $15 on eBay. And then I made a handle for it one day in my shop. So just a personal preference on the style of handle and types of uses that I want to get out of it. These carpenter style hatchets are incredibly handy and will cover many of your bases. Um, one of the biggest problems I have uh, is people using, um, this is an axe of course, but using the back of a, a hatchet or an axe as a hammer and that's not what it's intended for, um, especially uh, steel on steel. You can use, you can use the back of a, of a hatchet on softer materials such as wood. Um, this is, uh, I take this reenacting, but this is also um, in my, my falling rig. So I use it for delimbing and, and pounding wedges. It's a really awesome wedge banger, more on this later. Um, but if you do need something that's going to double as a hammer, then get a carpenter's hatchet because it'll allow you to do repairs. It'll let, let you, um, you know, get its intended use on both ends. And you have a little nail puller on here too. So as far as handiness and uh, versatility, these are great. Um, but still, keep in mind, try not to use the back of your, your uh, axes and hatchets uh, as, um, as a hammer. Um, it's not going to be the end of the world, but it's good practice to use a hammer to hammer things and use an axe to split things. So keep that in mind. Um, a nice hatchet is going to allow you to do finer tasks such as breaking down kindling. Um, if this is all you have and you have to process a, a bigger log, then you can add a little bit of extra force uh, with a wooden mallet uh, or just a, you know, a log that you can hold on to to get you a little more uh, power through on something like this. So consider this, there's, there's more research out there on period axes. Um, what the Army was looking for can be found in the 1865 Quartermaster Manual, as well as sort of uh, specific designs for various uh, sheaths and scabbards uh, for um, military tools of the time. So I highly recommend one of these, but you know, a $2 um, hatchet from a yard sale is going to be better than nothing at all. They're lightweight and will give you a lot of uh, usefulness around camp. Um, then you're going to have to consider whether or not you need an axe. Odds are you're not going to need one, uh, but someone in your company should have access to one, especially if you're doing some sort of winter quarters or a bivouac, um, or you need to process firewood for your unit. So. There needs to be discussion in your company who's going to be the wood splitter, and the axe that you choose is going to be a lot of per, about, it's going to be based on personal preference, um, experience, and what type of wood your organization typically gets you. Um, we've had logs um, at events that were as wet as if they were pulled out of the river, and as tough as if they were um, stone with bark painted on it. Um, so uh, a nice, you know, wood slasher like this um, gets me by in most in most cases. But if you have, if you're getting, always gets you like this really nasty, knotty wood. You might need a mallet uh, with a wooden handle. Of course, stay away from you know fiberglass. But most of the the axe patterns that we see today and the handle designs. Uh, were uh, already in place by the time of the Civil War. So you don't have to worry too much about sort of the, the, the combinations, as long as it's not obviously modern in some way. Now, axes are also another huge area of research. Different parts of the country had different um, axe patterns, as well as different uh, nationalities. So you can actually do a little bit of research to say, well, well, if I, you know, if my unit came from Michigan, then I might have uh, this style of axe. Uh, if I was from New England, I might have this type. Um, and even here in the Northwest, uh, we're we're known for a specific type of double double bit axe. So you can do some research, and this could be a good way to up your impression. There's uh, there are tons more videos out there um, about uh, axe craft and how to care. And, uh, maintain and use an axe safely, but this is just uh, an opportunity to, to ask, do you need an axe and does your company need one and what are those uses going to be? Um, I don't have it on it now, but when I, this is on my falling rig, I have it in an aluminum scabbard. Uh, when it goes with me to events, um, I have a leather sheath for it. 
all my edge tools are razor sharp and always covered and protected. So keep that in mind. And one thing I want to show you is a lot of people like double bit axes. Um, and they're great. Um, they, they all have their unique uses, uh, but they're not all equal. The first thing I want to show you, this one needs to be rehafted. But um, when you buy a, an axe handle, they, they come coated in like a, like a varnish. And that's just to make them look cleaner and nicer on the shelf for a longer period of time. But you can see the difference between the varnish removed and dozens of coats of boiled linseed oil on my personal axe and the sort of glossy um, modern finish that you see on uh, these just off the shelf unmodified handles. So you'll want to make sure that if you put a new handle on it or you pick one up with a brand new handle that you get rid of the varathane or uh, varnish with sandpaper. I prefer a card scraper. Get it off there, coat it with some linseed oil and make it look right. You'll be happier with it in the long run. Um, the other thing to keep in mind when you're considering the double bit axe is these aren't all good splitters. So what do you need this for? Is it part of your impression and you just need one and it doesn't really matter? You need to know if that's the case. Um, the other thing is um, you need to look at your double bit axis. Um, some are just for failing and they're going to have really thin cheeks and they, they will drop a tree in no time but they'll just stick in a hard piece of firewood. Um, the other thing to consider is weight. So you have profile, so look at the profile. That'll tell you if it'll make a good splitter um, and the weight. So Typically, the heavier the axe, the better it is going to be at splitting. So are you going to use this for felling? Or are you going to use this for splitting? Or are you going to use it as a combination, combination of both? Because some double bit axes will actually have two different types of bit. So you'll have a really nice thin cheeked felling side and um, a bulkier side um, for either like limbing or bucking close to the ground. Something that will hold an edge a lot longer when you're actually using it in the bush. So keep that in mind when you're considering a double bit axe and of course you're going to need to make sure that you uh, have a sheath for it keep keep everything oiled keep a little bit of extra oil with you and with a little bit of care and maintenance obviously this will give you many years of use in the hobby and in your personal life too maybe um one last thing uh, about this uh, about these sort of edge tools is sharpening um, with axes, a cheap little Lansky puck and like a little bottle of kerosene to wet it with uh, will we'll take care of you for tuning up your edge to uh, your axes and your hatchets in the field. Um, but honestly, my, my best uh, advice to you is to sharp, make sure everything's sharpened and ready to go before an event. Uh, that way you won't have to carry as much gear and um, you won't have to worry about spending all that time sharpening and maintaining your tools when you need it try to be ahead of it a little bit um, but if you are one of those units that does a, that do like a really big winter quarters or you do a lot of bivouacs you're eventually going to probably hit a tough knot hit a hit a stone and you're going to need uh, to dress your edge in which case if you're doing a lot of field craft then having some sort of um, sharpening kit is going to be priceless for you so again if you're packing light um, have your tools ready to go. If you're gonna be using this extensively in the field as part of your impression or as part of your event, uh, make sure you or someone in your unit has uh, tool maintenance equipment available to them. So one last thing that may not be very necessary, but maybe if you wanna get into bivouacking or winter quarters um, or other sort of long-term field impression sort of stuff, you may need a bow saw, something like this. Um, you, you see at the beginning of the video that I actually assembled this. Uh, this all breaks down. It's very compact. Uh, this pattern is straight out of uh, A.J. Hamler's Civil War Woodworking Volume 1, I believe. I've actually, I love this style so much I made two and I keep one in my, uh, in my Land Cruiser. And again, another blade, another protector on it. Um, so you can actually make a little, um, like a canvas sock or something for this. So you can fold it all down and wrap it up and then keep it in your knapsack so it doesn't take up a lot of room. Um, this, you may not need this for every event, but you, if you do a lot of um, field craft, camp craft, this will eventually come in handy, especially if you need to uh, process your unit's um, firewood from larger logs. Um, if you're building structures, this will be... Um, 
completely uh, invaluable to you. But again, um, what role does it part? Uh, what role does it play in your impression and your unit's needs? So this could be um, a really uh, useful tool. Um, if you don't have Hamler's book, there are tons of how-to videos on how to make these on YouTube. Uh, some really great ones on how to make these in the field with improvised materials, which could really um, be a lot of fun on, on a bivouac, for example, is actually making your saw. You just need to make sure that you have uh, a blade with you and you build your saw around whatever blade um, is available to you at your local hardware store. Uh, you can customize these for all sorts of different purposes. You can get blades for dry wood, uh, blades for green wood. Uh, you can even get fine woodworking blades uh, for bow saws. Um, they cost a little bit more, but I mean, you. There, there are still woodworkers in Europe um, that will use a slightly different version of this, but with a, uh, a fine saw in it for cutting dovetails. So this um, is an incredibly useful and versatile tool also. So, um, yeah, and then one last thing, I always gotta, you know, keep a mallet um, handy. Um, these are so useful. Um, this is going to protect your wooden um, tent pins longer than using a, a hatchet. Um, you can use it to, to drive your edge tools a little harder. Uh, you can even make wooden wedges and use this to drive wedges to split larger pieces of wood. Um, even if you just find a nice um, branch that fits your hand well, this is going to be a wonderful addition to any part of your edged tool kit. So I hope this introduction has been helpful to you. Let us know if you have any questions. And for all of you veterans out there, Please share your wisdom and your knowledge and your experience with Civil War Reenacting Camp Craft. Let's keep the new generation excited, educated, and well prepared for many years of reenacting. Thank you so much for liking, commenting, and subscribing, and we'll see you next time.